Hi, everybody. We're going to give Jace a few minutes to request in. I'm in North Carolina too, Scrappy Unicorn. <laughs> There we go. <laughs> Hi. How's it you? going? Good. How are you? I am doing well on this lovely Thursday. Okay. So everyone, this is Jace. My name is Kayla. And we're going to have a nice little conversation, very informal, about being young, Black, art historians slash curators. Um, as far as questions, we're going to stop about 15 minutes before um, 1 o'clock. And you can use the question function at the bottom. And so it'll be very easy for, for us to kind of keep the conversation going. And, you know, as you're thinking of questions, feel free to shoot them down in the right-hand corner. So, Jace, why don't you start off with your introduction? Uh, sure. So my name is Jason Overby, uh, otherwise known as Jace. Uh, I am a graduate of Morales College, class of 2017. Uh, I majored in art history with a concentration in curatorial studies. Uh, yeah. And then what do you do now, too? Uh, so uh, I am currently the curatorial assistant to contemporary art at Crystal Bridges Museum of American Art uh, in Bentonville, Arkansas. OK. And my name is Kayla Jackson. I graduated Spelman class of 2019. I also was a curatorial fellow with Jace, actually. And right now, I'm going into my second year of getting my PhD um, at Harvard right now. And so what we kind of want to start with is that ultimate difficult question about what inspired you to take your path? What made you decide to go into curatorial work versus maybe getting a master's or a PhD? Uh, I think it's a collective of, I studied art in high school. Uh, so from the beginning of like, you know, uh, middle school through high school, my mom was one of those folks who uh, figured out early on that art is something that I was really passionate about. And so she made it her mission to put me in any and every program that was kind of geared and focused towards art. Uh, and then so when I got to Spelman, uh, I was new on campus and I had just joined the campus paper. Mm -hmm. uh, and I had found out that the, well, not found out, I had, you know, discovered that there was a museum next door called the uh, Spelman Museum of Fine Art. And uh, I went to go see the very first show there that was Marin Hassinger. Mm -hmm. uh, and I actually wrote a review on the show. Uh, I thought I was some really hot critic. Uh, and I went to just like, you know, type and type and type and, uh, and lo and behold, you know, when I wrote that, re like that review actually made it to the director of the museum and she had reached, she and her team had reached out to me and kind of wanted me to, to, to like really come have that conversation with them. Uh, and since then it's been, you know, uh, sky just skies up, you know, uh, they told me about this program and I was like, you know, I had all this backing of art history, but I didn't really know what to do with it. But when I had sat down and talked with them and they had told me that they were kind of starting this program, uh, I realized that was what I wanted to do. I began to kind of really formalize how I could bring together all of what I knew into one career. And it could be something that I really still like love to do as a job. Uh, yeah. And what about you? So definitely Spelman Museum was a transformative experience, you know, getting able, being able to work with Dr. Brownlee and Ms. Ann and Ms. Makiba. 
um, is an opportunity that I think specifically all of us that were curatorial fellows that first year found to be extremely transformative. And so I would say that the moment that I realized I wanted to get my PhD was actually in a conversation um, with a professor that wasn't even an art historian. She's the director or co-director of African Diaspora Studies at Spelman, Dr. Asia Leeds. And just meeting over a paper, she said, you should get your PhD. And I never considered it seriously. It was actually a fear of mine, but I knew it was something that I needed to do. So having sort of people along the way really encourage me and push me was something that really let me kind of go for what people feel like is absolutely crazy, which is going straight through. <laughs> but I wouldn't have it any other way. I knew when I was applying, you know, I started very early sophomore year, sort of researching schools, meeting with professors. And then by the time it was my junior year, I had a job offer and it was between that and applying to school. And I knew that's what I wanted to do and never looked back. <laughs> and so when you say that, do you think that that, that mentor factor really kind of helped you decide like what you wanted to do? Like, you know, do you think that without that, that that would have been something that you would have really pursued to go for? Without mentorship, specifically from Spellman, I think I would have never had any type of longevity in this field. I would have never considered myself um, valid in that space. And so having great mentors, and even, you know, at the high work with Catherine Gentleson, having the right mentors and having mentors that sort of um, pick you up when you're feeling down that show you other ways of being are super important super important and I know you can speak to being a mentor and being mentored yeah I think that uh one of my greatest mentors for me has been uh I would say I tell people all the time that uh women have kind of walked me through art and so at every point in my life whether I was studying art or doing art women have kind of walked me through that and so but I think in college, uh, that that really mentorship factor for me uh, kind of really made me go for what I want. And so uh, having a mentor like Dr. Uh, Bar like like Dr. Uh, Brown Brown Brownlee, uh, having her as a mentor uh, kind of really pushed me forward to really go forward to do what I wanted to do. Uh, and while I'm doing everything that I was kind of really focused on, I didn't realize that someone was watching me as well mm -hmm. uh, so it kind of made me realize that a mentor is a great thing to have and at the same time as you keep on going up and up you have to reach back at the same time to mentor those who uh, want to kind of walk in that same kind of path as you and so I've had the honor of you know uh, mentoring uh, a number of young men and uh, women who are really excited about art who are really excited about wanting to be a curator and what that means. Uh, and I think that's why, you know, when it came for me to really kind of choose the field that I wanted to go in, uh, without my mentor, I don't think that uh, everything would have been as clear as day. And so I do know that there were days and nights where I was kind of weary, you know, I was kind of questionable, of, you know, if this was uh, the field for me, what I wanted to do. But I think having someone to call and have those tough conversations with uh, made everything better. Kind of, it brought everything kind of very clear to like, let me know that Jason, this is what you want to do. You mm -hmm. actually know you want to do this, but having somebody else confirm that for you and tell you that uh, this is for you, you know, that means so much more. Yeah. I mean, showing you that it's possible. Yeah. Like, you know, being that very visible kind of face and factor of what is possible within the art world. And I mm -hmm. think for me, uh, just having those visible folks, you know, it made me realize that I can actually do this, like this is something for me. And uh, just seeing folks who look like me uh, out there just, just made it all make sense. Yeah. And then just a little bit about how you arrived at doing sort of contemporary and photography and sort of the work that you're thinking about, the research interests that you have, like how you arrived at those? Uh, so I particularly started out as a studio artist. So uh, I started out drawing. Uh, and my mom could probably attest to this, that I was not patient enough. Uh, <laughs> in my mind, when a drawing or an idea comes to your head, 
I'm like, if I could get it all done right now, I'm going to get it all done, you know. Uh, but it was one of those things where I realized that, you know, my teachers would tell me you have to kind of sit, like, you know, with this work, sit with it, come, like, you know, leave it, come back to it. And I wasn't really ready for that. Uh, and so I kind of turned to, to, for, to like, photographs and, and, like, just photography. And since my eighth, well, since ninth grade year in high school, uh, I've, like, been practicing photography. I own my own camera. Uh, and it was at, at that point where once I got to college, I realized that I love art. Uh, I, I love making art. But I think that at the same time, I love the aspect on the back end. Mm -hmm. I wanted to figure out how could I tell the entire world about the artists that I was encountering? How could I tell the world about the art that I was seeing? So uh, curating for me did that. And I realized that, you know, once you start studying art, you can't study everything, you know, as much as you want to, you can't study everything. So you really kind of have to pimp, like just really focus on something. And so I think for me, I chose contemporary art, which typically begins at 1960 through present day. Uh, and then I did a more like, you know, specific focus on photography and then with a more specific focus on black American photography. Mm -hmm. uh, and so that's how I arrived at that point. Uh, and I think that it's one of those things that as you get older and older, you really kind of start to realize that at some point it actually chooses you. Uh, and I think that's something that you could speak to as well, like how mm -hmm. We love this stuff, but at the same time, it feels that this work is choosing us, you know? It's mm -hmm. kind of calling us to come actually do it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think in a similar sense, I too was a child artist. I think one of my best gifts for Christmas was a pack of copy paper, because I was always using it in the office, and my parents couldn't do anything that they needed to do in their real adult life, because I was, you know, thinking I was going to be like Lorna Simpson or something. And so... <laughs> I went to Spelman to be a studio art teacher, is what I thought. And then I got to the class and I too realized that the patience that you need for that craft I did not possess. And so I actually went to the curatorial meeting that I think we all went to where they were just kind of introducing the program. And then all of a sudden I was like, oh, there's this whole world that's made just for me if only I, you know, go seek it. And so specifically thinking about the work that I've done and the work that I want to do has always been about the everyday and the quotidian because I didn't grow up going to MoMA and Met or the Smithsonian's, but I understood very early on, even you know, without maybe consciously knowing this, that the home that I lived in, that my great grandmother's home was always adorned in a fashion that was supposed to represent herself. So thinking like Zora Neale Hurston will to adorn and Bell Hooks, um, Home Place is a Site of Resistance, I understood that there was a way that I had entered museums and archives and um, seen curators and archivists in their everyday existence without them ever having the same formal training that I decided to pursue. And so focusing on the contemporary, focusing on Black women, focusing on the way that um, domestic, like domestic materials become, you know, a part of artists um, ooh, is something that I really, really have to credit to my family. Like that's and just, I, yeah. <laughs> and I, I think just kind of going back to you, what you said about your like, you know, like just being in like, you know, your mother's house, grandma's house, is one of those things where I tell people house. that <laughs> I personally believe the first curator that I met was my grandma, you know? Uh, and this is me kind of getting to a point where I realized every season my grandma changed her house, you know? Yes. Uh, fall, spring, <laughs> summer. She had a different set of curtains, fabrics, tiles. And this isn't just for one room. This is for the entire house, house you know? Yeah. <laughs> uh, and so she's going through the entire house kind of changing things and switching things up. And so I think that for me really kind of, made me realize that that was the first curator I met. And then my mother, you know, was probably that second curator, seeing that, you know, me, me and my sister would do all of this art, you know, art that we thought was just, you know, regular. But uh, still to this very day, uh, if you go inside of my mother's home, 
the entrance way into the home is literally uh, like a art gallery. She has mm -hmm. hung every single work inside of like this front living room that we have had since we were maybe like, you know, 12. Uh, and it's work that I forget that she has. Uh, and so it's, you know, very interesting to see how, you know, those like, you know, like this kind of really started for us at home, you know, inside mm -hmm. our houses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think with both of us doing contemporary, doing work that is about Black people, we have a sense of, um, a different sense of what this moment means, this moment of Black Lives Matter and museums and institutions sort of displaying to certain depths, their allyship. And so, you know, the crux of this conversation is what it means to be young, Black, and in the art world. But I think the work that we do makes it even, you know, even more important to have those conversations. So I think for you, navigating museums and navigating, you know, that sector of the art world, like how do you sort of negotiate your positionality? Uh... It's tough sometimes because I think, uh, and I think especially with like now, realize that the body of Black folks have has been terrorized since the beginning of time, you know, uh, and it's me realizing that every so often, this kind of uh, spike in activism becomes in vogue every other three or four years. And so mm -hmm. what does it mean to see that happening institutionally every three to four years when you're living that life constantly? And so I think for me, it's kind of that battle of, well, like that like battle of, you know, uh, how do you do all the labor to really avoid being a victim? You know, uh, how do you, and it's one of those, slippery slopes where, you know, where I want to make sure that everybody knows, you know, where, where like we stand, but at the same time, um, it's tiring sometimes, you know, mm -hmm. it's tiring to have to take that on. But at the same time, uh, I would love to do nothing else than to kind of really tell the world about who we are, but at the same time, what it means to be inside like galleries, museums, and kind of figuring out how do you really pos like really position that for people who are really entering these spaces, whether it be for the first time, last time. And uh, that for me is one of those battles where like, you know, it's an ongoing struggle, you know, how do you really kind of uh, stand in that? And I think uh, that for me makes me realize that, you know, I want it more. I want it more and more. Mm -hmm. I want nothing more to kind of really talk about us. And that has me thinking, uh, what does that look like for you having, uh, going straight into a doctoral program right after, you know? Uh, did you take any time to breathe? Did you like go home? What was that like? Cause you literally graduated. And went <laughs> yeah, to yeah. Um, my, I, I guess it's easier too, if I just go from, from beginning to end, maybe we both should have done this. I'm gonna ask you to do it after me. Uh -huh. But freshman year was when I became a curatorial fellow. So that was the spring of my freshman year. Um, then I was a part of the Summer Academy through the Mellon Foundation. Um, that's at five museums. And I was at the High Museum. And then I interned at the University of Florida that same summer and also received the two-year fellowship for the High. So then my sophomore and my junior year, I was a fellow at the High. And as my fellowship was ending, I was working on a gallery rotation. And then in working on that gallery rotation, I went and worked at Spelman's Museum for my senior year, but then also ended up kind of getting roped into teaching um, the art history curatorial studies high school program. And so that's what those four years looked like for me, with of course other things in between, but um, that's my art historical journey. And then also as a senior, I was applying to graduate schools. So kind of starting my junior summer, I was studying for the GRE on my lunch breaks. <laughs> and then I took it right before school started, worked on applications all the way up until December, and then did like a mad dash of visiting um, <laughs> in the spring. So I applied to 13 schools. I got into eight and I visited five. And I did it oh, kind wow. of like back to back to back, which I 
don't necessarily suggest. Um, don't necessarily regret it. I just don't suggest it. Um, so for the summer leading up into my graduate school experience, I was actually very, very nervous in a way that I hadn't been in a long time. And I knew it was because I wanted it to be, I had so much riding on it. I had so much invested in it and I wanted so much from it that I wanted to make sure that I prepared myself, you know, as much as I possibly could. And so I taught for two weeks and then I went abroad. I went to Cartagena, Colombia to give a presentation on Magda's work that was a part of my senior thesis. And then the rest of the summer, I did nothing, you know, I took a break. I mean, I read occasionally if I, you know, got sort of like the itch, but other than that, you know, I spent time with family. I spent a copious amount of time with my grandparents and my great grandmother, who I'm always with. Um, and I did the things that I knew I wouldn't be able to do during the school year. You know, I took people to doctor's appointments. I ran errands. I did the things that I know I don't get to do on a regular basis. And so I will say that moment of of breathing, that moment of rest was really important. And it was something that I had never valued before. And, and it caused me to suffer greatly. I will say to anybody, always take your rest. It's something that's important. It's important for your mental health. It's important for your physical health. So I do, I do value rest no matter how much it looks like I work and do. Um, that first and foremost, because the question I get the most is when do you sleep? And it's always them they ask. Never. <laughs> I sleep. I, I believe in sleep. You need to rest. Um, so that's what my path looked like leading up to graduate school. And then, you know, come September, I hit the ground running. And, you know, now with COVID and the pandemic, of course, I moved home. So that's different. School looks different. Um, I still don't regret going straight through because there was something about the urgency that I felt to study and to work and to write and research that I knew, um, being in a museum just, it, it couldn't do it. It wouldn't do it and I wouldn't be satisfied. And so I think we both had this, you know, thought in that we do what serves us. <laughs> yes. You know, I don't let anything on my, you know, life plate, if you will, if it, if it doesn't serve me, I need to know its value. Um, so I knew that this experience would serve me well and it would serve my greater purpose. And so that's how I knew I had to go, <laughs> I knew. Uh, yeah, and, and, and I think just kind of going back to just my like entire trajectory, mm -hmm. uh, I didn't in start interning at museums until my uh, junior year. Uh, and so I had applied to be an intern at the Whitney my sophomore year, and mm -hmm. they denied me. And I was like, you know, one thing is going to happen. I'm going to intern at the Whitney Museum of American Art. Uh, and you did. <laughs> and I did. And, you know, I kid you not. I worked my entire, the end of my sophomore year to the, like to the beginning of my junior year to prepare my application for that internship. Uh, and it brought me no more happiness than when I got that uh, acceptance email in April of 2016. And so I think that from there, that kind of really sparked something in me. And so uh, following interning at the Whitney um my senior year I interned at the so and then I actually interned at Art Papers which is a magazine in at so it's like a local uh art magazine and then I went to the Brooklyn Museum my senior year and then following the Brooklyn Museum during the, the summer of 2017 I actually was a the what was actually one of two in inaugural curatorial fellows at the Louis Armstrong House Museum. Uh, and I took that fellowship for the simple fact that I wanted to step away from art, anything art for an entire year, you know. I wanted to figure out that if this is what I really wanted to do, leaving art, like just like leaving something and going back to it, uh, that would make me really realize if I wanted it. And I kid you not, I left that fellowship uh, running back to art museums. I realized that there is a special place in my heart for any house or historic museum. Uh, but I started to realize that the house was actually the only art. That was the only artifact. Mm. Uh, 
uh, and I wanted to continuously talk about art objects. I am really big on object-based learning. So I wanted to get back to dealing with art. I wanted to get back to dealing with like, you know, labels. So I, I wanted to get right back in the planning of it all. And I kid you not, I applied to every single job after, after I got out of that fellowship. I think I applied to more than 30 jobs. Uh, and But that was central to the tri-state area. And I was applying and applying and applying, and I was interviewing, interviewing, and I would make it to the last round, and they would, you know, say, hey, you know, we found somebody else, you know. But uh, I took really a huge leap of faith uh, when a friend uh, recommended that I actually apply to Crystal Bridges. Mm -hmm. uh, I had been to Crystal Bridges prior in uh, the year to come see Soul of the Nation. Uh, and I came out here and, you know, when I first came out, I was like, you know, this is a very cute town, you know, very great place. I would never live here, but cute, you know, uh, and it's, I think you said very, that. it's very funny to me to like, you know, really sit here and realize that, you know, uh, I thought I would never like, you know, come back here, you know, and so. Uh, but I had applied, I had got the opportunity to interview. And once I interviewed and I came out here, I uh, met the team. And so uh, I kind of talked with them and everything. And once I came out here and met the kind of team of folks here, it made me realize that I wanted to be a part of that team. You know, I support three outstanding curators. Uh, I am in a position where I am learning so much from three folks who have very different styles of curating. Uh, but coming out to Arkansas kind of solidified that I wanted to be a curator because uh, uh, people were joking like, like, you know, you're leaving New York in your early 20s. Mm -hmm. It's fun. It's popping. And I knew for sure that I was never leaving New York. Uh, and I only say that because uh, my mom called me and asked me, hey, can I sell your car? And I was like, of course. I'm never, ever going to need a car ever again in my life, you know? Uh, and little did I know a few months later, I would need said car. Uh, mm -hmm. And so that kind of solidified that, you know, uh, moving across like the country, that was one of those things that I was willing to do for art. And I think uh, us realizing in this field that sometimes we're going to have to go to, you know, say it very small town, you know, to grow, you know? And I think, that's the exciting part about all of this is that, you know, if you really want something, you're going to go get it. And, and I think it goes back to what we talked about earlier when we didn't have that, like, you know, patience to sit down and do this stuff. We realized on the back end, you actually have to have that patience. Yeah. You have to have that patience to be still and be ready to just kind of learn, be ready to kind of jump in at all. And, um, uh, it just made me realize more and more that, you know, as I started to really net more, well, really like network uh, with people across the field, opportunities come your way. You, you just really start to realize what is and isn't for you. And so my question to you, you know, having me going to Arkansas, what was it like for you uh, leaving Spelman and going to Cambridge? Like, what was that like for you? It was a culture shock at first, but um, as far as moving, I knew that probably throughout my 20s, I had no problems moving wherever, whenever. I moved a lot as a kid, and that's something that, you know, I took for granted the resilience that it built in me and, and a sense of adaptability that I can go anywhere, be anywhere, because I've made a home in myself. My home, my, my peace, my groundedness is, you know, is in me. And so... Moving to Cambridge was different, but also exciting. It was my first time being sort of fully on my own. Um, I mean, granted, now I am back home, you know, in my hometown. And so you could have never told me, you know, a year ago or in any time in my life that I'd be getting a PhD in Gastonia in Bessemer City, North Carolina. But that's what I'm doing. <laughs> and so... Um, moving is something that I think, like, when we talk, have conversations about getting outside of your comfort zone, um, part of my ability to get outside of my comfort zone was sort of a clarity of trajectory and a clarity of purpose. And so having both of those, like, always in clear view and sort of my, my guidepost, 
I knew that there was really no forever mistake, if that makes sense. And so also thinking about moving, like what you're saying, we wanted to go back to New York. I think about my mom always saying some, it's, you know, it's mean time, it's not lifetime. And so this is also a conversation of, about, you know, sacrifices that you make, you know, certain concessions that you make to sort of serve your greater purpose, your greater idea, whatever it is that you're, you know, aiming for. Sometimes it's not going to look like what you envisioned it, you know, to be. And that's happened to me many times and you kind of have to sit with it and you look at it sideways, like this is not what I asked for, but it is, it is what you asked for if you have like the faith, you know, and the patience. That's what we keep returning to is patience. Um, but as far as like you mentioned networking, I can attest to your incredible networking skills. I have been on many trips with Jace um, during my entire time at Spelman, all the curatorial trips. I've never seen anyone make space for themselves the way that Jace does. And to, it, it doesn't matter if it exists, he's gonna make it exist. <laughs> And so that's a skill set that I don't possess, but it's something that I think you can speak to about how do you, in, in, a, in a world, like the art world always seems so small, everything always seems so cutthroat. So um, against the idea that really Dr. Brownlee put in us, which is, is the collective. She told us all the time, we need each other and that we need each other more than we're gonna ever need the people above us. Oh yeah. Ever. It wasn't always about networking up. She was like, this is your network. <laughs> and so I guess you can speak to like how you built your network, how you got confidence in doing so. Because I mean, it wasn't like you were this age. You weren't, you weren't now Jason. You yeah. were Jason with, you know, the canvas bag and the jean jacket. <laughs> and you were going to make sure the professor Sarah Lewis knew that you tweeted her and you just mm -hmm. wanted to make sure she had a face and a name. And, you know, people remember those things. I remember yeah. that. She remembers those things. So just, you know, I, I think that's really great. Yeah. And I, th I think for me, it's me realizing that you really have to put yourself out there, you know? Uh, the one thing that somebody can tell you is no, you know? Mm -hmm. And if, you know, somebody else is telling you no, then you're probably not talking to the right person. So you need to go to somebody else. And so it's one <laughs> of those things where uh, for those who know me, uh, I talk to anybody, you know? Uh, I can literally enter any room and I'm going to spark up a conversation, uh, whether it be about, you know, art or whether it be about uh, the skating rink, you know. And so it's one of those things where I realize that, you know, uh, you really kind of have to show people who you are, you know, tell them, you know, this is this is who I am and I need you to know who I am. But I also need you to get with the plan of who I am, <laughs> because one thing it is, is that, you know, I am going to be around for a long time, but also it's one thing that I've realized, you know, I've had the opportunity to intern at phenomenal music, like just like places. Uh, but it's me realizing that the cohort of people who I came up with uh, in 2015 at Spelman, all of us, you know, we really kind of hold on to each other. And so whenever there is an, an opportunity out there, you know, that I know that somebody in my cohort can get, you know, I'm, a, you know, say, hey, I need you to go for this. But also it, it's one of those things realizing that uh, you really, once again, just going back to, you really have to show people who you are, you know. If you are hungry for something, uh, you have to show them, I am hungry, I want this and I'm gonna get it. Mm -hmm. And I think that for me points to, I never forget when I had actually in, on, I was on the call to get the uh, fellowship uh, at the Lewis, Armstrong House, like, you know, museum, I was talking to them. And so they were really looking for history and music people, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and I kid you not, I got on that card and I told them, you know, you looking for somebody who know, you know, history, music, and I was like, I know culture. I know the culture, I know what's happening right now. Uh, and I know what is going on. And I think that kind of really made them realize this boy might be on to something, you know? And, and, and so that for me really made me realize, you know, I'm gonna tell you who I am, what I do, and why I add value, you know? And so, and I think that's what we've all, uh, me, you, uh, Tyra, Cornelia, Nal Nalani, all of us, we really 
had to go for that, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. And it was one of those things that we realized that, you know, uh, Dr. Brownlee was going to put us in front of these people, but we had to show these people, you know, why. And so that's what really kind of really sticks with me. Uh, yeah. Okay, so speaking of having to show up in front of people, I remember my after my sophomore year, I went to the Driscoll dinner, and Dr. Brownlee, at the time, the curatorial professor, Dr. Bouchon Bird, and also my mentor at the High, Katie Dennison, all studied under Richard Powell, and they said, you need to meet him, you need to talk to him. They knew I was from North Carolina. They were like, you can actually go and like have a long conversation with him. And I remember my conversation with Professor Powell was probably the most intimidating, what felt like two hours, but I know could have been no more than 30 minutes because he's a busy man mm -hmm. of my life, but also the most transformative. And so you kind of, spoke on it a little bit, but I want us to kind of continue, even though this is not in our script, we've, we've done the script, other than our personal goals. Um, how do you make things work that seemingly shouldn't? So for me, I'm thinking about the fact that when I was going through art history, it was a time when the courses looked very different and there were certain gaps that I felt like I had, you know, in knowledge. And so for me, that was, I became very interdisciplinary. So I took classes in African diaspora studies, that's what I minored in, um, and became very close with Dr. Leeds, and that's, that's how I got on the track really for applying to a PhD. I took courses in religion, I took Black queer studies, so women's studies, I was all in there, English, it never mattered because I knew I could make anything I wanted to be about Blackness, and it could be about art. And I know I could do that with any class. And so making things work that shouldn't because you have a clarity of vision. Like, I think you can speak to that with the Armstrong house, but I know there are probably other times like academically because there are a lot of students that are watching, you know, you can be in these positions and feel like nothing is going the way it's supposed to. You can't, um, the opportunities aren't lining up just so. So how do you sort of have this clarity of vision to see beyond whatever is right now and whatever is the limit to understanding, you know, what's the possibility? Ooh. Uh, ooh, that was a good question. <laughs> uh, honestly, uh, I take it day by day, you know? But also, it's one of those things where, you know, uh, I read a lot, uh, and it's what I realize that I know what the, like, like, you know, I know the kind of future that I want. I know the future that I want to live in. I know the kind of future of what's for me. And I think it goes back to what you said about, you know, uh, you had this clarity about your entire trajectory. You knew what was for you. And it's one of those things where you kind of feel it, you know, but it's also mm -hmm. one of those things where uh, just reading and reading about those folks who had came before us uh for me uh it's kind of those things where like you know you're like tracking somebody else's history you know yeah uh and i will say you know the only reason i actually applied to intern at the whitney uh was because i knew that at one point thelma golden was at the whitney i was like you know i need to be there then you know uh and just like being a sophomore and junior you really have to kind of want it you 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 really have to want it but you really kind of have to put yourself out there uh you really have to put yourself within those circles of people and if you don't know somebody introduce yourself yeah. that's the easiest thing to do introduce yourself to folks who don't know you and once again going back to telling them why they need to know you you know what kind of value would you add to their you know institution their life, their field, you know, uh, and that's really what it is for me. Uh, it's really just going back to, you know, I really have clarity of what it is I want to do, what I am destined to do, uh, and what it's calling, you know, uh, and I think that's probably the same for both of us, you know. Mm -hmm. uh, it just really, I think this entire kind of talk goes back to patience, you know. Uh, we talked about it, you know, how like we didn't have that patience at first, but we realized, you know, at some point, you got to sit down, you know? You got to really sit down and just be willing to, like, you know, uh, take everything in, learn, and get everything that you can and get out of it, you know? 
-hmm. Yeah. And so also the clarity of vision is not without personal doubt. Yeah. So, you know, we both have talked about moments where you could see so clearly what you knew was yours, what you knew was meant for you, you know, however you, you received those sorts of things. Um, but there are moments where there seem to be so many things in the way that it's obscuring your vision. And so I think a good thing to talk about is what grounds you. Because for me, you know, being grounded in family, particularly family, that they like to work too. You know, I was raised around very hard working women in particular who, you know, it seemed like no dream was ever too big. Nobody's ever told me, you know, I have parents that were pretty, you know, laissez-faire. I, we could do what we wanted to do. We could dream as big as we wanted to do we wanted to. You know, it was like they would kind of lay out what the world was. They would, you know, show us a way, but it wasn't always the way. And it was kind of up to us to, you know, figure it out. And so I think how I was raised and who I was raised around and being grounded in that sort of sense that it is up to me, <laughs> my life is my own. And I make of it what I, you know, what I will, but also that no matter how much it is up to me, there is, there's a destiny, there's a, there's a purpose, there's um, something greater than me that is, you know, supposed to guide me and that I'm, you know, responsible for and to, um, that's what grounds me. And so I would like to know what grounds you in the moments when, you know, the, horizon seems to be, you know, so, 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 so far out of your reach? Uh, my sisters, my sisters and my mother. Uh, I have, uh, I like to joke and say I have 30 uh, sisters, but it's not 30 of them. Uh, and it's one of those things where I'm someone who I talk to at least one of my sisters every day. If it's not one of my sisters, it's one of them. So I actually have uh, seven sisters mm -hmm. uh, and I talk to each. I talk to one of them every single day. And I can tell you, I can get on one call with one of my sisters. And at some point, three of them have joined that same call, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, and it, it, it's it's going back to what you said, you know, nothing I dreamed was ever, you know, little, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, when I applied to Morehouse, I didn't get money, you know? I had literally turned down full scholarships to go to art school. And I was like, nah, mm -hmm. I want to go to Morehouse. And there were so many people who told me and my mom, you know, that Morehouse was not going to happen. Uh, I am Brenda's son. I am Brenda's <laughs> only son. Uh, and I kid you not, uh, Brenda made sure that happened, you know. Uh, yeah. And it wasn't only Brenda. It was all of my sisters, all of my aunties, all of my uncles. Uh, and if anybody that knows me, they know I am a family man. Uh, yeah. I come from a very huge uh, family. Uh, and my grandma comes from a huge family. Her people come from a huge family. So I'm very grounded and big on family, you know. I know what it means to have a mother that, you know, wants the world for you. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's why I am who I am today, you know. Yeah. Yeah. And so we're just going to wrap by saying our personal goals. But while we're saying that, any questions that you have can sort of go in the bottom and we'll answer them. You know, anything, it's all open. We want to be as helpful as possible. You go first, Jason. You're older. You tell uh, me first of those, <laughs> uh, I know that uh, I'm going to be within the arts for the rest of my life. Uh, I know that uh, art grounds me. Uh, art keeps me going. Uh, and it's one of those things where I go back to saying art is a part of the ecosystem that we all live in and I am a part of that same ecosystem uh, and I want to keep working in museums in some capacity for the rest of my life but at the same time I do know that at some point uh, I would like to return back home uh, and go back to the same high school that I got everything you know where I learned from you know and so what does it mean to kind of go back and start at a high school level to kind of help those students realize, you know, there is something that you could do, you know? There is something that is so much more possible for you, you know? And I joke and tell people this all the time, you know, the high school that I went to, uh, we studied art for four years. 
for four years. So I have friends that I know that can talk circles about arts around folks who just got it at a college level. You know, I have friends back home in Cleveland who they know they they can talk about art. They know it, they love it, and they got it. And so it, it's one of those things where I always want to realize how can we start before college and get those students excited about wanting to enter this field? You know, how do we get students excited about, you know, what art can do and what art has done for you, you know? Uh, and, you know, that's me, you know, it's, and then it's, it's me knowing that I do at some point, you know, want to return back to a city of black folk, you know, who I can really be, help to be that like change uh, agent for them and kind of really kind of pioneer and push that forward. Mm -hmm. What about you? So my personal goal, although it scares me, is to be a professor, um, be tenured. Um, and so I think in originally even doing curatorial studies, I know I want to have curatorial projects that I do in the future. But when I taught for the high school students, it was the most amazing, magical, like, high that I think, you know, you could ever feel. And it was so easy for me to see the impact so quickly is something that, you know, I was really gravitated towards. And so speaking of the high school students, there was a question about what advice would we give to high school students, you know, that wanted to follow in our footsteps. And so for me personally, when I was in high school, I went to sort of a technical high school and I studied dentistry and I knew I hated it, but I wanted to go to the best school in the county and so, I, you know, I suffered through. And I knew I loved art. So I would say that the first thing for me specifically as a high schooler, I remember myself kind of sitting, being okay with sitting alone and getting to know myself. So we've talked about, you know, a, a clarity and that sense of clarity that I think we both possess comes with knowing yourself. You can't choose between, you know, what we do without knowing who you are, you know, at your core. Um, and so that's really something that I did that I know was probably at an early age, but I was very invested in being very self-certain and self-aware. And so that's one step. But then also when it comes to following our footsteps as far as our history goes, is really taking advantage of this moment, you know, that is it's a devastating moment, but it's a moment where we've turned to the virtual world that should have probably always existed for, for you know, just the sake of accessibility. And so right now you're gonna have more opportunities to engage with the arts in ways that I wish I could have, you know, as a high school student, you know, and be, being unafraid to reach out to people. I talk to high school students, I'm never too good for it. You just, you, you email, yeah. you know, Google, all those sorts of things. You know, some, I would say maybe not professors at this stage, but graduate students would be happy to speak with you, to work with you, to give you reading suggestions, to just generally talk to you. You know, I still talk to some of the high school students that I taught, you know, last summer. And also there was a question, Jay's, which I know you can answer better than I can. How do you express yourself artistically and, or do you? And then if you have, you know, what's your latest project or thing? Uh, so I am a practicing photographer, but I do everything from photography, writing, uh, I'll be writing movies, TV shows, I'll be doing it all. But my favorite expression of creativity is skating, you know, <laughs> uh, the first thing, you know, I did when I got out here, I found me a skating ring, you know, uh, my skates is an eye view of me right now. And today's actually Thursday, so I'm going to be going skating tonight. You know, <laughs> I go skating every single Thursday, uh, and that's what keeps me sane. You know, it's nothing uh, like, you know, getting out on that hardwood floor to kind of really get your sense of clarity. But I think when it comes to art, just kind of staying creative. I read a lot. I read a lot of magazine, books, a mix of everything. You know, it's you really kind of have to get that pull from everywhere you know you can't just go to one place to get your inspiration you know mm -hmm. you have to kind of really pull all those in and so uh that's what it is for me and i visit art museums often but i'm also you know i talk to people you know uh yeah, yeah.
Yeah, that is partially a question of inspiration. So for me, artistically, I have returned to drawing, which I hadn't done since I stopped being a studio major. And surprisingly, I still possess some of the skill set. Um, but as far as like, you know, how do I guess I recharge? Because that's sort of like where we were leading in your answer. It's always talking to family. I talk to my family a lot. I talk to my great grandmother a lot. Um, because there's something about speaking to people like of that age bracket. Like I tell everybody, get you a couple of older friends because they're going to keep you grounded. They're going to keep you in check and they're going to make you feel loved. Um, it's something so amazing to witness her and her existence and to try to know her as a person, not just as, you know, my mama, which is what I call her. Um, I think something else that grounds me is always music. I always say that if I wasn't an art historian, I'd be a music historian. I grew up with a lot of music. Music is very important. It's actually how I communicate to my dad. It's just song back and forth and we know what we mean and we know what we're trying to say and what mood we're setting. Um, so I would say music is probably my other outlet. I wish I could play an instrument. I probably could if I would have had patience. Um, <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's probably what I would go with. I don't think there are any more questions. From anyone, unless you had a question, Jace. Uh, my can. question, I have a question for you actually. Uh, what does it mean to be a black woman, uh, especially right now with what's going on in the world? And, you know, I grew up around black women. Black women are what keeps me focused and what keeps me centered. But one thing that I'm realizing more and more is that, you know, not just like, you know, folks, but the entire world expects black women to kind of take the entire kind of just term like the turmoil of what we are going through and they want black women to do that labor and that work and so my mm -hmm. question for you is what does it mean to be a black woman right now uh studying you know art but having to see what's happening in the world you know yeah what is it like to be a black woman who studies black women yeah. um i would say at times it can be taxing, but the biggest thing that I've had to learn for myself is, is to say no sometimes, just mm -hmm. generally just a flat out no. Um, and to not leave the no as, as room for negotiation. It's a no and it's a no. Um, I mean, I <laughs> because some people will treat your no as sort of like a stepping stone to getting you to open up negotiations to still do the labor that you, you flat out said no to doing. And so I think it's also about being diligent about what you take in, what you take on. Um, it's um, it's this way of thinking that I think, I feel like my mom used to say, it's like what, what is around you, what do you put in you will come out of you. And so I am always very careful about the images that I consume. You know, if, I, if I'm in a class, which this can happen to anyone, and I feel like an image is, you know, violent in any way, and there's been no foundation or conversation that's gonna set it up so that it, it, it doesn't do further harm to me, I'm gonna, I'm gonna step out, you know, I'm gonna excuse myself. And so there's a way that I think being a black woman, you have to constantly be ready to care for yourself, not just your physical self, your mental self, um, in these spaces, particularly academic spaces and you sort of need to have a good sense of self-advocacy, but also knowing the right people that can help you advocate for yourself. And so it can be taxing at times, you know? Sometimes I find, like I've found this time that I've been home to be quite refreshing, you know, even given the circumstances, because it's a time where I'm surrounded by people that will care for me in a way that sometimes I cannot expect, you know, in the professional sense or in the professional world. And that's, you know, I've actually had a more positive experience in that most of my mentors, you know, across the board have extended care, but there will be times where care is seemingly just scarce and it's not, it's really not. I practice care and I, you know, I want people to practice it for themselves. That's the biggest thing that if I were ever to give a piece of advice is you need to care for yourself. 
that is where the longevity is. That is where, you know, your brilliance lies. Nothing gets done if you are not caring for yourself. Any other questions? No, this is this is good stuff. Questions. Anything. <laughs> Okay, I was making sure I was doing the question thing right. There are no questions. I don't think. No, just comments. Jace, your family really loves you. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I don't have any more questions for you. Other than I can mean, I can just throw that back at you being a black man. I guess actually no. When did you realize, or what's the feeling of being so rare? Because there's a rarity of people in your. There's a rarity. Oh, let me tell you. Yeah. So it's one of the things that where you, <laughs> where you start to realize, you know, some people are uh, very uncomfortable around you because they cannot figure you out. You know, people. I realize more and more people want to know who you are at. You know face value. I want to know everything about you as soon as I meet you, you know? And I realize more and more is that, you know, uh, there is a kind of, you know, uh, rawness. There's a kind of happiness. Uh, live, like, just like, you know, you start to realize, you know, and sometimes I am a big personality, you know? Uh, and some people can't take big personalities, you know, and mm -hmm. I am totally fine with that. But what I do realize is that, you know, if my big personality is, you know, making you feel uncomfortable, uh, then you might have to go just kind of sit with yourself and really kind of figure out, you know, uh, who you are, you know, and, and I think that's, you know, what I realize a lot of folks, a lot of folks are really struggling to figure out who they are, you know, and that's something that we don't come to immediately, but it takes mm -hmm. time. So uh yeah yeah and i think we can take these last two well there's actually three dream okay. project or exhibition i'm gonna let you pick dream project or exhibition um advice to people that did not study art history as an undergraduate student and then how does it feel to be in close proximity to your role models in this field uh i'll answer the how does it feel to be in close in proximity mm -hmm. uh it feels phenomenal, you know? It's one of those things where you start to realize that these people are tangible, you know? That you can actually, mm -hmm. like this, like these are folks who you can call. These are folks who, you know, you can email, but it's at the same time, you know, you start to realize these are folks who you are not only excited to meet them, but they are also excited to meet you. Yeah. At some point, they heard about who you were. They ain't, they ain't never met you, ain't never talked to you, but they heard from somebody about who you were, you know? Uh, and they are actually real people, you know? Uh, mm -hmm. And so, and I think one very uh, visible moment for me, uh, going back to Thelma Golden, was I was an intern at the Whitney, uh, summer 2016. And, you know, I'm going up to introduce myself to Thelma Golden. She's like, Jason, I was like, you know, it, it it's, it's one of those things where, you know, we have to realize at some point, folks are real people, reach out to them, email them, talk to them. And that's probably the quickest, you know, point of access that you have to them, you know? Yeah, yeah. I think these are real people. And then being Dr. Brown with babies always helps. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but I think we should, well, 42 more seconds left. And so I think, I would say the being in close proximity is something that's very rewarding, honestly, to be succinct. And it is something that makes you realize that everything that you sacrifice, everything that you do is, is very well worth it. So thank you all for tuning in. Sorry for any questions that we didn't get to answer, but you definitely could just DM us respectively. And we appreciate you tuning in. Anything, Chase? Nah, I'm good. <laughs> it's like seven seconds. So All right. Silent. All right, bye.